Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. When people think of the X-Men, they often think about the political or social illusions that are often used in them. Is Magneto uh, Malcolm X and Professor X Martin Luther King? Is the whole thing a metaphor for queer rights or for racism or for anything else like that? What would they be like as activists or, or the like as a meme that's going around now? Well, we're talking about more than 50 years of comic books, and so we're easily going to answer those questions in 90 minutes or less. And I'm doing all that with good friend of the podcast, Steve Sorneman. Steve has been on this podcast a bunch of times, and I've been on his. He is a comic book expert extraordinaire, but also has a large background in politics and activism and loves to talk about the kind of things that we talk about on this podcast. So, Steve... Uh, welcome, and tell us a little about yourself. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited. So in addition to uh, having read most every X-Men comic that's ever been printed, probably about mm. 90% of them, it's, it's not a feat that I'm particularly proud of, but, you know, <laughs> we roll with it. Um, yeah, yeah my, my previous life uh, was as a uh, activist and community organizer starting from about age 16, uh, you know, I was a junior in high school when 9-11 happened and kind of got thrown, you know, w grew up uh, poor into the punk scene and mm. kind of got thrown into politics that way and um, started uh, learning just like how to be uh, specifically my background come uh, in, in politics, in activism comes from the sort of like um Saul Alinsky in school of community organizing so you set a yep. goal a group of people you go out uh you create confrontations with the system and, and confrontations with power that sort of like uh help you um achieve your goal uh essentially and and understanding political power and the types of community power that normal people can can gather and wield and so that's that's kind of like uh you know I come from uh, the anti-war movement uh, against the war in Iraq. Um, I have also, you know, uh, both as a freelance organizer or or a self-directed organizer, but also working for nonprofits. I've worked uh, in the anti-nuclear movement. I've worked uh, for trying to get better access to mental health um, uh, services and uh, been in the Occupy movement, et cetera, et cetera. I've been all over the place, but generally, I think the the important part is is that I I really I believe in this sort of um, community organizing model as mm -hmm. as, as sort of a um, a, a method, and and I think the because we see all the the movements and injustices as as mm -hmm. very intertwined, um, yeah. the the in my opinion is like you know what you work on like as long as you understand that you have allies and fellow travelers and and you know people in in other movements are working towards the same goals as you um i i, I think which movement or which part of the movement you happen to be a part of is is kind of a smaller part than or or is it, it's more interesting to me how you're what you're doing how you're doing what you're out uh, outlook is so that's yeah. kind of what i bring to the table <clears throat> no and that's awesome and you and i actually have connected over this before yeah i come very much from the same school i i totally. was trained as a community organizer read alinsky back to front mm -hmm. and uh a lot of my career first in you know um uh, uh in you know pro-choice pro-choice reproductive justice work and then now more recently in some of the other work all comes from that community organizing background and part of what inspired this particular discussion that we're having today is there's a meme that was going around and i forget if you sent it to me or i sent it to you or our friend will sent it to both of us yeah yeah but it basically was about like you know there's a canard often that goes around about you know why is it that the right is so incredibly well organized in their activism but the left you know you take a bunch of leftist activists and it's like trying to herd cats and someone put up this meme that was like the the best metaphor to explain leftist activism or even liberal activism or whatever is the X-Men, yeah. you know, in terms of how they are all generally wanting to go in the same general direction, but they all have different ideas and they're always fighting with each other and they're always like disagreeing. And everyone's like sleeping with each other all the time and it's a giant <laughs> interpersonal mess. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, quick, quick aside, <clears throat> uh, because I was working for a politician at the time, yeah. I, I couldn't get involved more directly with Occupy than I wanted to. Sure. 
but I was, you know, it was a fairly left wing politician. And so I was asked to kind of keep an eye on it. I made friends with a lot of people in some of the Occupy movements. And I unfortunately just have resting therapist face. And so <laughs> if I make friends with someone, they're probably going to want to talk to me about what's going on in their life. Sure. So I would have all these conversations with Occupy people I'd met, and I'd want to be talking to them about how things were going in the movement. But, and I got some of that, but a lot of what I got was, oh yeah, but you know, I was sleeping with this person in the movement and then this other person started sleeping with them and this other thing. Totally. And I don't know how to feel. And so, yeah, that yeah. statement that Steve made is not just a joke. <laughs> um, but I, did, I love the meme of it though, because A, it's a great way to look at them, but also I, I think it is really interesting to think about how you know, we have all these debates about like how much politics was there or wasn't there in comic books. And, you know, you get people who will be like, no, why, why are the, why is it also woke now? Why is it all the right. politics now? Which is somewhat ridiculous, but I think, you know, there's a lot of ways in which the, the, the political ideas or the social ideas of the authors have often been fairly subtle in a lot of the comics and in a lot of them it's, it's, it's turned from being more left wing to more right wing to, you know, all over the map. Yeah. With the X-Men, it seems there's always been this, you know, much more in your face kind of social ideology, a metaphor for oppression, a metaphor for being different. And so I've wanted for a while to get my hands around this. And yeah. this is just such a great opportunity to do it. And uh, today, just for as we're still doing this under the strikes, we're mostly going to be talking about what happens in the comic. <laughs> Some of the stuff that happens on screen, I'm sure will come up. We're we'll yeah. talking more about general trends. And let me kind of start there with uh, Steve. Given that we have more than 50 years of comic books that we're talking about, can you say exactly like what Wolverine's politics are or who <laughs> Professor X is a metaphor for a real life figure in American politics? Yeah. So um, yes and no. I, I think these the like you said, there's been uh, 61, 60 years and counting of, of X-Men comics mm -hmm. now, uh, although 50 is more accurate because there was 10 years where they were near or several years where they were nearly canceled. Whatever. The point is uh, there you can't you can't go through with a fine tooth comb of every single thing that they've done in all the storylines and say mm -hmm. this is, a, you know, morally and politically consistent character that's out the window um right. and so yeah i might draw from examples uh here and there but generally i want to stick to like kind of the conceptual true north of these characters because mm -hmm. that is pretty sticky right when yeah. you do a new adaptation in film in television uh they character usually has like a consistent like what makes them tick what's important about this character that's what we're going to to uh focus on in the adaptation or in a new comic story most often uh and that's kind of what i'm would like to talk to uh, more about uh yeah. here on the show so why is it that you think the x-men in particular is so often seen as the the one that is the most social justicey focused or the most kind of activism focused what is it about the x-men as a comic idea that lends itself to that uh well i think there's there's two things. Uh, the first is that, uh, you know, the characters of X-Men are mutants. Uh, mm -hmm. They are a separate class of people, you know, in this, in this case, it's genetically, but you can, you can kind of transpose that idea and, you know, many, many uh, creators of the comics and, and the, the adapted media have always do, right? right? That this is, uh, and transpose that onto uh, different, classes of people that are set apart whether it's um a black community or whether it is queer community uh you know the these this concept of this being uh a, a, a people rather than mm -hmm. uh and the the x-men or the representative like mutants uh who villains or heroes or whatever are rarely they are the most visible ones but they they kind of like stand out from or speak for or kind of represent publicly a much larger base of just like regular people who are mutants whose mutation might be like they're they have a funny color skin or they burp butterflies or just like mm -hmm. something that doesn't 
translate to like you shoot laser blasts from your eye like 99 percent of mutants have these extremely uh you know much more subtle less flashy uh mutations and so it, it Not ends up designed as the combat mutation someone would take when building a character that totally. spent a lot of points for yeah. yes yeah, yeah 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 and so it the, it ends up being uh because you have this as a separate class of people it ends up being uh you know always always about difference and how difference get you know gets dealt with in society right and so that, so that's one part of it i'm sorry the other part is that um the most superhero groups i, I like to think of superheroes as uh, as activists uh, the, the closest analog to activism that we have in uh in a lot of uh, popular media because they are they're people who want to work for community benefit for altruistic reasons. And I think if you look at like a lot of popular media right now, like we're kind of just exiting the the uh, goal, this sort of like peak TV uh, golden what, prestige TV. That's the word. This prestige TV era of like difficult male uh, protagonists who have comp you know uh complicated uh morally gray uh lives and all of that um and and that you know uh it's kind of like the classic hero of literature is a much more um uh the conflicts are internal they don't deal with the outside world uh right. and they are uh largely trying to contextualize a, a hero's actions or a protagonist's actions through their psychological factors rather than like a genuine desire to do good for the world and these are things that are not represented in a lot of pop culture except through superheroes however superheroes also are extremely conservative uh as a, a cultural formation and the fact that when you go out to save the world you're basically trying to save the world as to continue to exist as it does. You're not trying mm -hmm. to change anything. And the the way that the X-Men set themselves apart is inherently they are trying to change something. Their uh, goal, their mission isn't save the world. They do that to build credibility. They do that to build sort of like um, uh, goodwill towards the, the human world. Uh, but their ultimate goal is utopian or progressive. They want to work for an equal society where, you know, humans and mutants have equal rights, uh, live alongside each other, etc. I love that. And I think it's really true. I think it's it's funny because, again, the, you know, all the discussion about wokeness and which I, I bring up as a way to understand what's happening in politics. I tend to think that the... <laughs> To me, people, when someone says, like, well, are you woke, what I generally think is, like, I don't think I'm woke because I think that word doesn't have any meaning anymore. But the people who are afraid of people being woke, I'm probably what they're afraid of. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, but I, but I also, I don't want to – I don't want to uh, – uh, I don't want to demean anybody else by saying that their politics that don't agree with me are unwoke, which – to me connotates like they haven't woken up to the truth yet they can have their truth that's different from mine right exactly exactly yeah. and and it's, yeah there's so much to say there but it's, yeah. but it's, like, it's a help <laughs> shorthand for the kind of a, it's, exactly you know what i mean yeah totally no it's a mean. good sh yeah but to me i love the way you talk about that because although i think where i was going there with that originally is the idea that like there's often a perception that all these superheroes are now seen as so woke or whatever the heck that means. Right. I, I think you're making a good point that there is something inherently kind of conservative about the idea of the, um, not only fighting for the status quo, but also of, you know, the one strong person often, but not entirely a man today, but sure. for most of superhero history, a man who can use violence to do what they think is right in the world. Absolutely. And yeah. Obviously, I mean, it, I say a critique like that, which is often then used to dismiss superheroes entirely. I, you know, I have this podcast. That's not my position. Yes. I think superheroes are great, and yeah. I think can can take on all sorts of different social or political or cultural meaning. But as you said, it's important to name that as one lens through which that can be understood. And I love looking at that as the X Men being different from that. Mm -hmm. And I want to get more into this, but there's, there's two kind of questions I want to throw at you first. One is, 
because this is the part that I've always stumbled a bit with, and I think the X-Men do address this, but I want to hear you talk more about how there's a great metaphor there, clearly, for the way we humans will look at a group and say, you all are different, and so we're going to treat you as though you are bad or scared. And often, like, that, there's a lot of fear of you. Yeah. And then a lot of the times, that fear is based on stereotypes and mythology and other ideas of difference that are wildly overblown. Yeah. And you can look through history to, you know, all the myths that were believed for so long. And some people still believe about, you know, people of African descent being sure. stronger but less intelligent and all the other kind of racist canards totally. or the ideas through history and that we see right now about queer people or especially trans people being groomers or coming for your children or all these things that have literally no basis in fact. Yeah. And that same thing with the libels against Jewish people or Muslims or any of those things. The, the reality is in almost all these cases that the people we're afraid of are a lot more like us than we than than the, the fear would like to ha have us believe. Yeah. With X-Men, it would seem that for the most part that's not true. That the you know, this is a group that is significantly different from humanity, at least on the surface, and does have powers that, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, in, in, you know, the like, well, but what if, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I play poker a lot, uh, and, and Paul Hoppy, my regular, uh, one of my regular guests is also a big poker player. We've talked about like, what would the ethics be around? Like if someone could read your mind at the poker table sure, or someone who like couldn't get arrested by the police because they have like all the powers they do. The yeah. police are terrible. You know what I mean? But yeah. how, how do you, how is it you think that X-Men is able to square that circle of they're a metaphor for all these groups that we're afraid of without any legitimate reason, even though they are a group that is fundamentally different in a lot of ways from the rest of humanity. And, and <laughs> is there some justification to the fear people have of X-Men in a way that's not true for oppressed groups in our own world? Uh, I, I think you come up on an incredible point here. Uh, yeah, no, they don't handle the, that well at all. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's an absolute mess. Uh, and yeah. it, it's a big hole in contradiction in storytelling, uh, uh, of trying to, you know, it, it comes up sometimes, but it, all it does is give the villains justification for like, yeah, we are afraid of you. You're powerful. You somebody, you know, one yeah. of your guys almost blew up the world the other day, you know? Uh, and so it's like, I, I, uh, and they're like, well, that was the bad mutants and we're the good mutants. And they're like, I don't care. So uh, at yeah. this point, like it, it, it turns um, X-Men. And this is one of the things I want to argue later is, is it ends up turning the X-Men comics. They're not really about social justice. They don't do anything. They're not activists mm -hmm. in the traditional sense. They have this utopian goal, but most of what they do uh is either policing other mutants essentially like uh, another mutant is going off and and planning some you know terrible plot uh to hurt and enslave or whatever uh and they go and intervene right right uh or they are reacting uh to uh you know the government just made new sentinels that are going to round up all the mutant you know things that are are very um uh they they react to when whenever they have um uh whenever they conflict with the human world and the the bigoted world right mm -hmm. um the their role is essentially reactive they're not out there doing lunch counter protests or you know right. uh or organizing uh mass support uh, in sort of this Alinskyan model that we're both familiar with to change power relations um, with the human world in, you know, and, and actually work for mutant equality. Um, and I think that's mostly a fault of, um, well, uh, it comes from sort of the, the, the background of most creators of superhero mm -hmm. media not being of the oppressed class or not being familiar with social justice movements and what actually creates change and so there's a lot of you know uh you mentioned the the comparison between um 
Martin Luther King and uh, Charles Xavier uh, at the top of the show. And I think a lot of that uh, comparison comes from the fact that they're both referenced as having a dream. And yeah. if you look <laughs> into the and, and and this is such a like a uh, uh, white liberal society reading of what Martin Luther King was, what he stood for, what he did. I was like, oh, he's just a guy who made some speeches and he had a dream. It's like, no, he was an organizer. He was creating confrontations with right with <clears throat> uh, white society it, that he would win and he knew he would win in order to advance a larger goal of equality all of that is completely missing from x-men media right. and it's it's a shame i remember to get where you're coming from there and it, in some ways it's the same complaint that i have about the movies and the like uh of all superheroes but it's like in the same way that you know i would want marvel civil war to be tony says we need accountability steve says Maybe, but your version of accountability in the Sokovia Accords really sucks. And yeah. then the next hour is the two of them debating how the Sokovia Accords should be. Right. But that doesn't sell tickets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you need somebody yeah. to punch somebody in the face at some point. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm guessing it's the same thing in, in X-Men. Absolutely. I would push back, though, a little bit in that, and maybe this is just more what's on screen, but doesn't Professor X often, like, characters like Professor X and Jean Grey, aren't they often, like going to testify to Congress or meeting with the president or, or speaking out in ways that are meant to allay the fears of the wider public about mutants in the, yeah. in the kind of way that, like, you're right, Martin Luther King or any other activist did so much more than that, but that is a part of that activist work. Sure, yeah, you show up on, you know, t um, the news talk shows or you give speeches. So it's more like an Al Sharpton, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, or a Jesse Jackson than... Um, that well, Jesse Jackson was pretty involved in the uh, the Southern yeah. Christian Leadership Conference, so maybe more. Uh, uh, yeah, Sharpton was too. But basically, you know, it it's that kind of public figure role rather than right. like the the organizer, um, which is fine. Like the movement needs everybody. The movement needs people with all sorts of skills to do everything that they do. It's important to speak to the public and and give them right. a, a face of of what you're fighting for, what it's all about. But, uh, yeah, uh, the generally when you're making these comparisons, it there are also historically contingent based on how history views these civil rights figures, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at, at different points. And that when you're straining for the analogy, that also changes the characterization of somebody like Magneto over years, where it's right. like, no, he's a villain, no, he's a hero, no, he's a villain, no, he's a hero, right? The, our changing understanding through history of, of who these civil rights figures are often affects um, yeah. how they are, how the fic fictional characters are portrayed as well. And, and so building on that, and I want to talk about the Martin Luther King, Malcolm X thing in a second, yeah. but... Is it fair to say then that, because I do think there is still, obviously, I mean, this is why we're talking about it, there is still a lot of social justice to be found in the X-Men stories, but it, it's not that they are acting in the same way those groups would act in our own world, and, and so it's not a perfect analog, but that they're meant to be a metaphor. It's meant to be yes. that the, the way that other people treat them is very similar, even if, yeah, maybe the fear has some more justifications, but yeah. still, because as you said, and I think this is something that doesn't appear on screen anywhere near as often as it does on, pay on the page, like, if you just watch the X-Men movies, I think it's a fair statement to be like, huh, it's kind of weird that genetically all the mutations are deeply combat relevant. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in a way, that, as you're saying, because that's actually not the case in the comics, that there is all these people who are, act that maybe the... The idea that all mutants are something to be feared or anything like that is actually very much not true, that there are yeah. some standouts, perhaps. Yeah. So, so do you think it is fair to say that, like, that that's where we find the social justice messages is when it's being used as a metaphor and when it's being used as like a person can say, like, oh, even with all the powers they have, the way the mutants are treated is really not fair. Oh, wait, that is actually kind of like the way... Oh wait, that's actually kind of like the way this other group in my in my own right. world is being treated. Yeah, and and I think there's one more thing that um, particularly uh, resonates with uh, the sort of the metaphor for the queer community, 
Um, and it, because, like I said, the the X Men have have kind of been stapled onto every social justice, uh, you know, community. Right. That, uh, any anybody who's working for equal rights, you've got you've got an analogy there. And um, and you asked one time, I think it was on, uh, I forget whose pod, but you asked particular, mm-hmm. uh, uh, particularly. What is the difference between the X Men and other superheroes? Why do we expect it? We, why do we accept that you know the Fantastic Four, the Avengers, are universally beloved by mm-hmm. the human population, and the X Men are feared and hated? Right? What What's right. this gap? How How are they different? And I think the difference is it's because mutants are our children, are the humans' children, like. It mm-hmm. and and it's this sort of like it, the 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 closeness that breeds fear and distrust. Anybody could be a mutant. Anybody's kid can end up being a mutant. And it ta- right. taps into this um, uh, metaphor with sort of LGBTQ uh, mm-hmm. acronym plus uh, uh, communities where yeah you you don't know. It, there's a theory called social reproduction, right? Uh, uh, from sociology, where when you, um, you know, uh, society reproduces itself by keeping people like in in a sort of familiar uh, space from largely what they're used to growing up. Um, if you are a worker, you're going to continue. It, it, it's it's you know had it had its uh, origin in, in Marx, and so it was largely viewed in class terms, but uh, essentially. Uh, it it's a counterpart to physical or you know like uh, physical reproduction where you're making babies uh, and this is the, this is its counterpart in sociology where society reproduces itself and part of this is that uh, you expect your children to be like you in certain ways values right. you know if your children have different uh, largely wildly different values than you that could cause a major strain and uh, for people who view a core part of their identity as this sort of like um white heterosexual cisgender uh you know uh you want your kids to look like you or act like you or or in a certain way right like you have this expectation of uh of this social reproduction that you're able to pass on to a future generation in order to essentially see yourself in the world uh, uh right. in the future uh and mutants subvert that uh, in the same way that the queer community subverts that in a lot of ways, right? Like right. Uh, your kids are going to have a wildly different life than you. They're going to have these 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 different experiences. They are not. Uh, ne- they might be less likely to make more kids who are more like you, and and sort of the, it throws a spanner in the works of human white straight humanities. Uh, conception of building this future that they can support and recognize right. and i think that is uh in both cases can be a source of tremendous bigotry i really like the way you phrase that and i think it's a really helpful model because i think as you said like that fear of social reproduction is there with all these things you know if yeah. it's the reason why people are afraid of you know their children marrying someone who's not of the same race they are sure, or yeah. who doesn't worship the same god they do or mm-hmm. who has different values, you know, who isn't, you know, of the same economic class that they are or whatever it is. And then with the queerness, there's that additional factor of a lot of time, you know, that it. And then with queerness, there's the additional factor of there's this fear of recruiting. And I, I, one thing I remember distinctly from some of the movies, and I know it also came out in the comics, especially in the nineties was that, you know, one of the fears was that like, well, you know, parents saying to to kids like, well, "Have you just tried not being a mutant?" Right. You know, as I said to Bobby in 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 one of the movies, or as yeah, uh, you know, this idea of that the fear is that uh, Professor X or any of them are are spreading um, yes, you know, uh, mutantism, which is very much the fear you hear today about like grooming and stuff. Like I, you know, it, all absolutely, that kind of stuff. yeah, yeah, and yeah. So yeah, I think that's such an important way of looking at it. Of how that metaphor can be there. And we've talked a lot about the, um, and we kind of touched on the whole, like, 
the way they're viewed that the the original kind of like oh it's martin luther king and malcolm x and i want to talk more about that because i think now there have been a lot of uh memes and and other information going around that kind of debunks that theory to some extent or another and uh, especially just in that like the public perception among white america of who martin luther king and malcolm x were in the 60s but all the way through history has always been like the actual real figures has been very different and if anything they were seen as a metaphor of the way the media portrayed those two characters. Right. Um, th- there are two factors, though, that I wonder if it, it's fair to say that, because I know now when some when I hear people say, "Oh, but those so these metaphors make no sense whatsoever," <laughs> I want to push back just a little bit to say, is there a way in which there is some element of it, and and part of it is it may also just be like writers who are viewing it through those lens or seeing sure. it. And what I'm getting at is that I think often in activism, and this is a trend throughout any activist movement, but Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were kind of slotted into these social roles. With groups like that that you're talking about, there's often these two different perspectives, one of which is what's often referred to as assimilationism or something like that, which is like, hey, no, we're just like you. You need to stop being afraid of us and let us be a part of what you are because, you know, we want the 2.3. 2.3 kids in the white picket fence, just like you right. do, Yeah, yeah. And, that the, and, and also that the, the idea is, and so to do that, we're going to confront your hatred, we're going to confront your fear, but we're going to help try to understand that we are not scary in the way that you seem to think that we are, that we should be. Yeah. And on the other side, there is the like, no, F you, if you're scared of us, you should be scared of us because we're going to fight back. We're not the same as you. We're different, but we deserve the same seat at the table as you do. Yeah. And I'm taking two massive social movements and, and hugely generalizing them and hugely <laughs> writing them down. But that I think, like, and this is something I really studied in school, that you see that kind of dynamic within a lot of social movements. And so it's definitely in, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are somewhat stand-ins for those two things, but... To reduce those two actual historical figures to that is is very reductive. Yeah. But you also get it within, you know, feminist movements or within queer movements. Yeah. Um, at the time of the 90s, there was very much, there was kind of like the, even today, we talk about how the human rights campaign does great work, but seems to be very much like, don't be afraid of us. Yeah, as respectability to some other groups politics, that are like, yeah. As opposed to other groups that are like, no, F you, we're here to help you tear down, you know, the traditional ideas of, you know, what gender roles should be and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. So. Is it fair to say that there's some element of that within the Professor X Magneto of one perspective is more on that side of I we want to be like you, we want you not to be afraid of us, we want to just be a part of your world. Sorry for the little mermaid quote. Mm-hmm. Uh and the other is more, no, we are different. Putting aside the supremacistness that Magneto sometimes gets into, yeah. uh, but just that more idea of no, we are different and you're gonna stop treating us badly because we'll we're gonna fight back yeah we're we're gathering power that we we will use in self-defense for sure yeah yeah yeah. uh i I think there is uh that is definitely uh a key difference ideologically between professor x and magneto uh i wouldn't say that that necessarily maps on particularly well to uh the difference between uh dr king and for example malcolm x uh but yeah i think that there's well yeah is it fair to say that it maps on not entirely but somewhat to the public perception of those two figures at the time yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and which like we said before changes uh yeah you know historically based on how we are viewing these historical figures at any given time uh totally agree with that uh but i think if you were to, I want to, I want to make some comparisons now between the civil rights movement, historical mm-hmm. civil rights movement uh, figures and X Men characters. Uh, meant to be in good fun, I'm not a a tremendous expert on the history of the civil rights movement. If mm-hmm. I, 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 this is meant to provoke discussion. Please, if you have another idea of of like where you can find commonalities and metaphors, please you know, respond with them in, in the comments or whatever, uh, yep. hit me up on social media. I would love to discuss it. Uh, but I want to do this in a way that is, uh, villain hero agnostic mm-hmm. because 
those constructs both in the comics and in history is so contingent based on the historical moment or what perspective yeah. you're viewing from, right? Like one group can look at the Black Panthers and say, well, they killed a bunch of cops, uh, you know, or were involved in a bunch of shootouts with cops. So like, the, you know, we see them as villains. And then another group would be like, they fed free breakfast to thousands of kids and, and lifted people out of poverty right. using only and, community organizations. And most of the organized. shootouts were often them acting in defense, not Exactly, attack. exactly, exactly. So and, I, I just, want, uh, yeah. Before you get into the individual characters, yeah. I do. I, I just want to use what you're saying just to make. I, I think you're kind of implying this, but I just want to state it directly and see if you, you agree that part of how Mc, the, the character of Magneto has changed quite dramatically from pure villain in the yeah. original to often seen as antihero or even like no Magneto was right. Yeah, <laughs> mirrors the way. You know, in, in the '60s, Malcolm X was the boogeyman, was yeah. the like the fear. Whereas today, I think for a lot of people, not all, but for a lot of people, there's much more of like, no, Malcolm X was right about a lot of things. and that, Yeah, or, you know, you know was a, a great leader and did wonderful things. And whether or not you agree with all of his ideology, and I think there's a lot to nitpick in there, mm -hmm. you know, was was an incredible figure for um, right. uh, for civil rights and leadership and, and uh, you know, black power in a way that uh, was a strong positive for the world. And, and that Dr. King and Malcolm X were, were, were actually much, I want to say, and that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were actually much closer than is generally believed in the same yeah. way that now uh, Magneto and Professor X are getting closer uh, in some, anyway, so yeah. just wanted to make totally. that. Yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> Thank you for but spelling it out because I, yeah, I, I kind of like brushed past it a couple of times, but it needed full mm -hmm. elucidation. Totally. But yeah, so now let's talk about some of the other specific characters and where they fit. Yeah, so I think if you're going to look for um I I think the the sort of like Nation of Islam uh uh comparison to Magneto's group kind of make does make sense in a in a mm -hmm. in a way. Like separatist uh and uh maybe a a undercurrent of supremacist in there. I'm who's to say uh, it's not for me to to particularly critique right. but um it the the sort of like there's a, a strong a, almost religious uh following around a character or a, a figure like elijah muhammad um that you know can kind of mirror somebody like magneto uh although he has a tragic backstory that's closer to to malcolm x's uh, so there there's something there i don't think that the southern christian leadership conference which was martin luther king's um Mm -hmm. uh organization is a very good comparison for the x-men because like i said before like they're not designing confrontations with power they're not going out there with a with a particular set of goals and campaign in mind for how to achieve equal right. rights um i and think they're certainly not using nonviolence as a Totally. Organizing principle. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Said, you wouldn't have the fun fight scenes that everybody loves in comedy. Exactly, books. exactly. Um, so if you if you kind of look at like community defense and uh, providing services to your people as the core organizing principles of what the Black Panthers mm -hmm. were, I think that translates well to the X Men as well. Yeah. Um, so that would put, you know, uh, Eldritch Cleaver as Moira McTaggart as sort of like a visionary it, it, close to the founders who kind of goes mm -hmm. a very hard different direction later in life uh, and maybe uh, puts like uh, Charles Xavier more as a Huey Newton kind of figure, which I think is an, an interesting, uh, uh, you know, thing uh, comparison. And then maybe like, the Fred Hampton is like Kitty Pride, like the the somebody from the younger generation who everybody just really, really likes and yeah. is brilliant and uh, able to do wonderful things. And, uh, and with yeah. Wolverine then, and I, I, I don't know if there's a specific figure I would name this to, but I think it's a part of the movements a lot. Yeah. You know, you go to any union move, you go to any organizing movement and... The, the word organizing is essential there because there will often be lots and lots of people who are affected by a social justice issue. But when you say, okay, so come to this rally at this point, at this time and place are going to say, 
ah, come on, I don't want to be bothered. That's not going to do anything. <laughs> yeah, but, I'm not you know, enjoying or, it or whatever. Yeah, and I, I say that somewhat, um, you know, that sounds kind of derogative, Tori. I don't mean it as that. I oh, mean, no, I, a, lot I, of, a lot of those rallies don't do anything. It, it's not necessarily a reason to not show up. They're 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 organized to do different things. Uh, most rallies are not directly the the tip of the spear for it, actually accomplishing social justice goals. And a lot of so even putting aside the rallies, a lot of social justice movements don't meet their goals. And so I think yeah. the the cynicism of a character like Wolverine is super important as because to me one of the goals of organizing is to helping like it's the moment that. Professor X or often Jean, Jean Grey or someone else like that is able to convince Wolverine to join the movement to be a yeah. part of what they're doing. Yeah. And as you said, the fact that like sometimes he does it because he's convinced of the rightness of their cause. Yeah. Sometimes he does it because he thinks Cyclops is an a-hole and he wants to show him <laughs> that he's better. Sometimes he does it because he wants a chance to get closer to Jean Grey. Right. And you know, a lot of people of my dad's generation went to peace marches because that's yeah. where you found people who had a lot more sexually liberated ideas. You know, like <laughs> I, I'm not justifying that kind of thing, but I'm saying sure, that, like, yeah, yeah. The, the fact that Wolverine and a lot of the others often have like it's not that they become diehard idealists, no, like, diehard idealists, but they still sign up and and come involved. Yeah, is actually a, a great part of the metaphor as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I was having trouble finding. A, a good civil rights uh, uh -huh. analogy for wolverine uh so i didn't try too hard but uh i'm sure it's out there somewhere yeah. um but yeah like i i think if you were to try and again hero villain agnostic tactics agnostic who is the set of characters in the X-Men world who is trying to design these confrontations with the system, who is doing big, flashy, public, of you know, sort of uh, confrontations to advance mm -hmm. human uh, mutant rights. Um, and, uh, you know, has a history of sort of like cooperating with the government when it suits them and working completely independent and being targeted by the government when when it suits them um i would say that's mystique's brotherhood called the brotherhood of evil mutants but again we're going agnostic here and and their tactics yep. are often things like assassination which obviously wasn't what the southern christian leadership conference was up to but uh, there's nobody else really in the X-Men world who is like, I'm going to do this big flashy event that it, or, or like act up, for example, like we're going to do yeah. something extremely public and extremely, uh, like, uh, uh, targeted in a way that you is not only going to gain us visibility, but is going to directly accomplish our goals and, and put the the system that we are in confrontation with put them in sort of a crisis point where they have to respond to our demands or lose legitimacy. And, and just to further clarify that for folks who might not know, ACT UP was a group of uh, queer and, and queer line activists who were really focused on the utter lack of attention to, a, to HIV AIDS mm -hmm. and how no research was being done in the 80s and 90s and, and no attention, you know, there were no Really, and then it was often being written off as a gay disease or a drug a drug user disease, so we didn't care about it. Yeah. And so, ACT UP did, among other things, because the Catholic Church uh, in New York City and, and throughout the world, but especially in New York City, where ACT UP was focused, was very one of the strong people pushing against any attempt to look into this because, like, oh, you know, not that this was the official Catholic position, but you know that that you know if this is God's punishment and all that kind of stuff, and there were definitely some high up. Catholics saying things like that. Mm -hmm. And so they did things like die-ins. Like they went to a St. Uh, the Cathedral, St. Uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in the heart of New York City mm -hmm. and just took over the services in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think you're right, Mystique. To me, when I said about how like um, the, the, you know, the two different poles of activism are replicated not only in civil rights, but in other things, yeah. ACT UP versus the more traditional gay rights movement is exactly what I'm talking about. Because yeah, totally. Uh, in the same, you know, because like a lot of the more, you know, traditional gay rights movement was horrified by ACT UP and they thought what yeah. ACT UP was doing was terrible. Yeah. But but a lot of the others, you know, and there's been some great like histories of ACT UP that were that were written in oral histories. And I love listening to some of the people saying things like I had to publicly condemn ACT UP. Right. But I always knew 
that I I needed ACT UP to be scaring people enough <laughs> yep. that I looked reasonable enough that, that, that the society would, would negotiate with me. And I think totally. that's such a thing. And so I love that idea of like, yeah, that there's a way in which Professor X needs Magneto and Mystique and others doing the more extreme things as a way to be like, hey, talk to me or they're going to burn the house down. Yeah. You know? And it, but also that like what ACT UP would often do is to, as you said, challenge the moral legitimacy in ways that I think Mystique and the others definitely do. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad. It, and like when we're saying like villain agnostic or whatever, like if, if we take it from the, the standpoint of the movement where it's like the people who are working toward, you know, within the, within social justice movements, they may have disagreements, oppositions with each other. This is the, the leftist infighting, the herding cats, the everyone sleeping yep. with each other, the, the chaos ball that we were talking about before. Right. But there is in opposition there is a villain there is an enemy and that is like the j edgar hoover right the ku klux right. klan like the the people from outside your society who do hate and want to kill you and are you know in the in the or and are lynching normal people or or, or lynching you know the 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 non uh uh the the people who are not a uh, part of your movement who are not uh, organizers or who are in in like J. Edgar Hoover's case, actively assassinating and murdering your leaders. Um right. and so, you know, there's and, like and a we're Henry, not physically you know. assassinating assassinating their character or yeah. assassinating their finances or do other things to undermine their power and stuff like that. Yeah. But also plenty of literal assassination as well. Like yes, I'm going through true. all these histories and I, I was doing all of the the, you know, um the comparisons uh, of all these characters. And I'm like, man, I wish Fred Hampton got you know, 50 years of continuity, like, like, uh, um, like mm -hmm. Kitty pride, you know, I wish that we would, would had the opportunity to see, you know, later in life, uh, Martin Luther King or, or, uh, Malcolm X and that these, that these care that these historical figures, these leaders would be able to be revived and grow and change and, and continue to influence right. the world. But, you know, in real life, they were just murdered by mostly yeah. by the government well and so let's talk about no i, I want to acknowledge that more before just the topic. <laughs> yeah. no and i think that's such a good point and i think that's in some ways one of the things that comic books can do is they can tell the reality is that a lot of the social justice movements that we have in throughout our society either flat out lost or felt like they lost at the time but then wound up having like some degree of victory, you know, that, that only really showed up, you know, through social reproduction and these kind of things yeah. decades later. And, and I think it's one, it, I know that as an activist, I often needed hope. And yeah. like, West Wing was a show that I watched all the time. And it's funny how today it's up, West Wing is viewed as a liberal utopia that by leftists is often looked at as like, this is all the problems with, with liberalism and with like the Clinton right. takeover of, of the Democrats and all that kind of stuff. At the time the show was coming out, I was working for, as I said, a much more left-wing politician. And um, it, for those who don't know, it was Tom Dwayne who was the first uh, openly gay and openly HIV positive politician. I, I think one of the first elected to office of any kind uh, after Harvey Milk, but, but certainly That's one of amazing. the first in the, in the New York State Senate and all that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I and a number of the other, like, you know, staff aides from other or just people who I knew through Occupy or activism would often get yeah. together and watch West Wing totally. because for us it was a it was a fantasy because there were so many times when the president in that was faced with a choice that Clinton was faced with because coming right. out like at the end of Clinton and then during Bush yep. where you know he has the chance to say the era of big government is over the way Clinton did and this fantasy president chooses not to um <laughs> and, and so a I think it's funny and relevant discussion about how the way something can be viewed in its cultural context changes so much later, 20 years yeah. later, so much 20 much years later. But the point also was that it gave me, it gave us hope. Like there were times mm -hmm. when like it, cause it was an inspiring show. And part of that's cause Sorkin yeah. is very good at writing. Great, a, great characters, snappy dialogue. Yeah. And you yeah, analyze it more yards. and you're like, okay, this doesn't make as much sense. But in the moment, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah I'm fired up. And yeah. I, I love Toby and I love CJ and et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think there's some value in the same way of when an X-Men, like, yeah, maybe the social justice movement wins an awful lot more of the time, and that's good, you know? Yeah. That it gives us yeah. that kind of hope and, and inspiration there. 
I want to shift to, because we've kind of also been touching on this idea of like the historical evolution of things. One of the things that I think we've been talking about, you know, as I said, one of the reasons why the, the King Malcolm X uh, break, uh, uh, one of the reasons why the King Malcolm X metaphor idea breaks down a lot is that, you know, as, as socially liberate, as, as, as is, is because, you know, someone like Stan Lee and, and Jack Kirby, like, they were people who were trying to be as, as aware as they could of these movements and they cared about them. They were also yeah. trying to sell comics and make money. Mm-hmm. But I think also, you could say Jack Kirby a little more than Stan Lee, but yes, absolutely. I think that's very fair. But still, it was also, it was white guys trying to do their best to understand a yeah. black civil rights movement, or then absolutely. straight guys trying to do their best to understand the queer movement. Yes. That's changed. And to, like, mm-hmm. in, I mean, not just like in the last two years, but, you know, over the last 50, 60 years, the representation of who is writing X-Men comics has shifted a lot and is not just white, straight, cis men as much. Still much more than maybe it should be, but, but not as much. Do you think that has, if we can talk about general trends over, you know, eight different comic book lines over 60 years, <laughs> but do you think that there are ways in which you can see that, that more and more of these are stories being written, that if, if the stories are a metaphor for oppressed groups in, in the United States or in the world, that more and more it's being written by people who are in those oppressed groups? Um, yes. Absolutely. And, yeah. and that it, it's slowly starting to do a better job of kind of taking these metaphors, uh, tackling them much more uh, intelligently rather than, you know, from the outside, like engaging overly much in respectability politics or trying to uh, trying to say that somebody gave a speech was the turning point for an entire social movement or something like that. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, like for example, a, a couple recent one one recent book in particular that I would love to highlight, if you don't mind me giving a comic recommendation Please. on here, is um, uh, "New Mutants" by Vita Ayala, uh, and that just wrapped up last year. Uh, Ayala's run went for um, a couple dozen issues, something like that. Easy to pick up and read. Uh, relies it, it, it draws heavily from uh continuity of knowing these characters i don't because i also have that continuity in my head i don't know how much the story relies on the reader already knowing these so it mm-hmm. might be a difficult uh one to pick up but it's so good because uh so uh vita ayala is a um non-binary black queer uh uh writer and they are uh they you know got put uh, they got the job on uh, New Mutants and completely upended the entire tradition of how character development happens in comics. And mm-hmm. I, I don't want to understate how momentous that is uh, because most going back to the days of, you know, uh, Chris Claremont, who is sort of like the 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 most influential writer on X-Men and, and actually in comics in general, I, I would argue right. uh, from the seventies, eighties uh, into the nineties. Um, Claremont had a theory of character development, which was you just punish your characters. You just subject them to horrendous torture all the time. You push them past their breaking point and in where they become, where they go, where they become uh in in that sort of torture in in that pushing that is where your character development happens and ayala and some other contemporary mostly uh female and femme and queer creators are saying like no that's trauma trauma isn't how you ch- how you grow healing from trauma is how you grow and so they take all of these like horrible things that have happened to these characters and they do it within a lens of conflict that makes them fun compelling readable stories um but they actually show their characters confronting trauma healing from it changing based on the healing and uh, this is the kind of like smaller piece of perspective maybe that you're talking about of like how storytelling mm-hmm. can change and how how these stories can can be better developed from uh, more diverse creators who know a little more what the hell they're talking about when they take on 
uh, you know, writing the stories of characters from these um, oppressed, oppressed and underprivileged groups and, and draw from personal experience in them. And th- it ended up in some really spectacular stories. So uh, you contrast that with something like uh, even just 10, 15, uh, like 10 years ago, uh, there's a, a white guy named Rick Remender who wrote uh, a run uh, combining like uh, X-Men and, and Avengers. They're called mm-hmm. the Uncanny Avengers. And it had Havoc giving a speech about how he hates the word mutant and, you know, he's going to be a leader, but just don't call him a mutant and was wild, mm-hmm. widely reviled as just like um, totally tone deaf, just right. the, the worst kind of uh, tone deaf politics. Uh, and so, yeah, it's comics is getting more diverse and it it really reflects well um in a franchise like x-men where it the intent was there all along to 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 speak to these issues they just didn't let themselves do it well yeah i hear that i hear that we've gone almost an hour and there's kind of <laughs> there's so much more we can talk about this this would probably become a series we do more of because i'd love to kind of analyze individual characters or like small groups within the larger thing sure uh, and by the way, we are going to talk more about the uh, everyone sleeping with each other uh, in the Patreon <laughs> section, uh, in the member section. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. But the last thing I want to kind of touch on, and, and curious how much you think this plays in, I think one of the reasons why a lot of superheroes are often seen as kind of like speaking to a more, and we say conservative, I don't mean in the kind of way it's defined today in terms of like right. Republicans, Democrats of today, but like. Very One of the useful. kind of like yeah. <laughs> essential ideas of like American history often, but often just the way we view history is, you know, like the one great man of history. Yeah. That like there's one person who, as you said, one person gives one great speech and everything changes or one yeah. per And in, in superheroes, it's more often like one person defeats one evil person. Yeah. In con- you punch this guy in the face hard enough that. Yeah. And everything falls <laughs> apart. Yeah. And, and I, I actually had um, uh, Becky Allen on the Star Wars podcast a while ago to talk about the significance of Star Wars moving towards more of ensemble shows with things like Rebels mm. and uh, uh, Rogue Andor. One and stuff like that. Yeah, it's yeah. more about like a team working together instead of just one individual person. Interesting. Yeah. Talk. I'm curious how you if you see kind of a similar dynamic in that one of the uh, like that. Because it seems to me that another way the X-Men is kind of a standout from a lot of other comics is that, you know, in some cases, like, you have one strong person who has their team of, like, you know, it's Arrow and the Arrow team or, like, you know, Batman right. and the Robins and Overwatch or something like that. But that the X-Men is much less the, the story of one strong individual and much more the story of this large ensemble of people. And, uh, yeah. and that alone feels like it's a big challenge to like that kind of overall mythology of the one strong man. I'm curious how you'd see that. Oh, I totally agree. That's a fantastic point. And I would say that it's not even it it even goes bigger than that. Like the the um ensemble cast that you would expect in like a super like Avengers, you know, you've got like a seven person team or something. You've got like a much more bounded limit. And, you know, X-Men are just notoriously messy for like they because they just they were so popular in the 80s right. and 90s that they just kept it and, and the team concept is so core to it that the team books have always done much better or or have been a much stronger like part of because like you said this is you're practicing solidarity you're part of a family you're part of a found family which is another important part right. of the queer metaphor um and 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 so it, it's in your in your like cooperation your confrontation your your interactions with other mutants that you develop sort of like who these characters are and what they stand for uh and then they just kept adding more and more and more and more teams so you know and then they wanted to keep every everybody gets invested in these minor characters that get added to one team back in 1985 and then now they're like okay we need to make sure that all of our characters are accounted for in some books and now you have like a hundred, two hundred different mutants who have been part of a team yeah. at some point, and they're part of this. And then, like hundreds more. Like recently in the comics, all of the mutants have created 
a, a nation called Krakoa. We've talked about it on this pod before, mm-hmm. uh, where it's kind of like a mutant separatist nation that wants to deal with other um, other contemporary nation states uh, to establish I- equality. So it's kind of a fusion of Xavier and Magneto's uh, visions uh, and Apocalypse as well, but that's for another mm-hmm. time. And um, and it's uh. It it's huge. There are just yeah. <laughs> hundreds of thousands of residents of Krakoa, and and it they really done their work into making this feel not just like an ensemble, but a society. Like this yeah. is this massive group of people who disagree in fight, uh, have to come to consensus. Uh, need to build solidarity with one another. They've been, you know, enemies for most of their lives and are figuring it out. And uh, and that is unique because it goes even beyond sort of the team ensemble and into mm-hmm. full social. Like it, it's not uncommon in this Krakoa era to just have cameos from uh, people who are outside of the main team of the comic uh, all over the place. And you're like, wait, am I supposed to know who this person is? I do because I've read all the freaking comics, but you know, it, they, they come in, they fill a purpose. They, they represent a particular point of view and then they might drop out for another, you know, dozen issues or so. Uh, And, and it really builds a vision of, of this as, yeah, as a full society, as, as a, something far beyond just uh even the small group unit of a family or an ensemble yeah and i actually think that's so important and i think that that's one area where i am so glad that you're so knowledgeable about the comics because (laughs) i think that you know for me as someone who's mostly watched the x-men on screen yeah I think that they definitely capture some of the kind of social justice aspects. You know, you watch X2 and and it's yep. so Great clear movie. that it's a yeah, it's so clear that it's about uh gay rights and queer rights and things like that and you mm-hmm. know that's where that parental scene I was talking about comes from. <laughs> yep. But like I was trying to do the math in my head, I'm probably going to be wrong and please don't yell at me. Ask Paul about how good my math is in general. But if you were to take every named character who's a mutant in yeah. every single live action X-Men uh, production that's been on um, probably maybe like three dozen at the most, yep. you know, yep. and in any individual movie, just because of the nature of the movie, like maybe you have like six to 10, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think you'd be, I think it'd be easy to watch those movies and think, the primary characters of every X-Men movie are <laughs> yeah. Professor X, Magneto, Mystique, Wolverine, uh, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Rogue, and, and maybe one or two others. And then the rest yeah. just kind of come and go as bit players. No, and, and hundreds it's so of not... main characters in yeah. X-Men comics. And and they're they're all great. <laughs> That's right. the thing. There's and, so many great characters. And as you said also, like, yes... Iron Man and Captain America and all them do team up into the Avengers, and yes. a lo- there's a lot of other team ups that happen. But whereas, like, I'm gonna make a guess here, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I I would guess that like, if you count up the total number of appearances that that to- that Tony Stark and Steve Steve Rogers have had, Captain America and Iron Man, that the overwhelming majority of times they appear is in a Captain America comic or an Iron Man comic with a small but growing number being when they appear in stuff that's under the name Avengers. Whereas I would say, like, w- I would, I would, it would, it would be closer to 50, 50 or, or slightly in Avengers favor, just okay. because you can turn it, it. They publish so many freaking Avengers books, you know, they'll usually okay. only have one, like one Captain America or Iron Man book going at once, but they'll have like three or four Avengers books. So it, it okay, over. that's fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess my question, though, is would you say that, like, the number of individual Wolverine comics versus times Wolverine appears in an X-Men comic <laughs> is a similar ratio? Because my, my guess is that the ratio oh. for a Wolverine or a Cyclops or a Jean Grey is going to be much higher. To, well, 
maybe, let's say Wolverine's maybe the bad example, but for like yeah. a Magneto or a Cyclops or a Jean Grey or totally. any of them or Beast. Yeah, Cyclops has been, you know, a member of the X-Men most of its existence for, you know, 50, 60 years, whatever. And he's he's very rarely had a solo title at all, you know? Yeah. Like, you could... I would guess that he's had maybe two dozen issues of solo titles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's, you know, yeah, his his poster child for this sort of, like, found family aspect of of um uh, of the x-men cyclops is a very yeah. interesting character that doesn't get translated into uh I, into adapted media ever but I that's was fine say earlier if we're looking at uh protest movements cyclops to me is the person who's like okay but we have to make sure that we have every permit and that our par- our, our protest never jaywalks and that like we i would disagree like, with that but that's a that's a comics okay. reading i i would i would characterize cyclops as uh the the march tactics organizer that is also is absolutely making sure that both the the black block and the um street medics are extremely well organized and prepared as well as the um you know the police liaison or whoever okay I, <laughs> he's a character i'd love for us to talk about more about at some point because i think in the movies at least yeah, my impression he's a stick is in the he's he's normal he's normal vanilla white guy stick in the mud represents rules right. he's the contrast to uh to he, he's he's just Wolverine's foil essentially yeah exactly he he's yeah. the person who's there to make it clear why Jean Grey should choose Wolverine instead of him <laughs> which in the comics I know is because I remember we talked about this and you were like yeah I kind of like Cyclops I was like what he's such a dork but like anyway yeah there'll be more to talk about there all right. Uh, one one thing I want to mention, by the way, because I, I I was thinking about this as I said it, and then didn't get a chance to to put it in. Uh, I earlier said that you know Stan Lee and Jack Kirby like often were writing about they were writing metaphors for movements that they weren't a part of. Yeah, I I do want to say that they were white, they were cis, they were straight. At least as far as we all know, they were Jewish at a time yes. when I don't want to minimize anti-Semitism today. It still very much exists, and, and I'm not going to get into debates about like you know where right. Jews fall exactly. But right. I think it is important to understand that at the time they were writing, being Jewish was a much more overtly uh, oppressed, you know, non-favored group than it is today in some parts of today, etc. Uh, yeah, Jack the- Kirby would go out and find neo-Nazis and beat the hell out of them for fun. Right. Not even <laughs> neo-Nazis, like actual Nazis. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, it, that's right. It was, it was the time. Uh, yeah. in which there were actual Nazis, yes. But j- just wanted to say that say that thing. Anyway, um, are there any other last comments you want to make or, or throw in here? Uh, no, I think we had a great conversation and we touched on uh, anything else that we didn't touch on. We can always come back and talk about again. Yeah. And of course, uh, listeners, if you think there's something we didn't touch on or something you want to argue us about or tell us you agree with or tell yes, us about please. your own experiences, any of these things, please let us know. Uh, if you go to the website, The Ethical Panda, or just find us on the True Story FM uh, webpage, or just look at the show notes, you'll find all the ways to contact us. You can reach out on Facebook, on Twitter, on TikTok. Uh, I'm going to be trying to make a post about these episodes every week in both, I'm going to revitalize the Facebook page and also do something on Twitter. Uh, right now, I know there's a lot of people leaving Twitter, I think for very good reasons. <laughs> as far as I can tell right now, they're all leaving to eight different ships. And I just, I, I wound up, within a span of four days, I created three different profiles on three different things that everyone's telling me, no, this is going to be the main Twitter replacement. Sure. <laughs> I, I can't, so I'm going to stay on Twitter for the moment, but once the, it kind of solidifies, if you think there's one I should be on, let me know. But certainly let us all know, or just send us an email, whatever you want to do. I will share it with Steve. Steve will be back on. We'll make sure to go over that feedback. When that happens, Steve just gave a thumbs up, which you can't see because this isn't streaming, but I definitely wanted to report it. Um, I'm, I'm not like my co-host, Will. I will verbalize things. I was just waiting for a I, pausing I conversation it, to do so. Well, and look, Will <laughs> is a streamer, first and foremost, so it totally makes sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we and we streamed some of these episodes, so it's fine. But yeah, let us know in the show notes. And of course, by going to the theethicalpanda.com or finding us on True Story, you can also find all the information about my other podcast, Star Wars Universe Podcast. Uh, during the strike, we are continuing to cover, we're not covering the stuff that appears on screen, but it turns out actually there's a huge amount of Star Wars content. There are 
comic books, there are uh, oh, yeah. novels, there are people who do as both professionals and just because they as amateurs they love it incredible work making lightsabers and cosplay and fiction of their own fan fiction in the star wars universe so there's lots to talk about there and of course uh if you want to support these podcasts the best way to do it is to become a member uh i've mentioned this before but i want to kind of reiterate uh i've now officially shifted these podcasts over to the true story.fm family of podcasts uh, if you've heard the Marvel Movie Minute that I've been on, that's a big part of it. There's a lot of other great podcasts there. I think, Steve, have you been on that at all? I know Will I have it. No, that. just Will. Okay. I'll definitely make sure you get connected to one of them because I think yeah. they just do great analysis of Marvel movies. Uh, again, you know, wait till after the strike. But on True Story FM, there's so many other great podcasts and things like that. Uh, but if through there, you can become a member of this podcast. It's basically the same as Patreon, just with a different uh, different people running it. Uh, less overhead costs, uh, but it's the same kind of a thing. All the patrons have gotten, you know, f their their membership transferred over to there, and it's a great time to become one. For five dollars a month or just fifty five dollars for the year, you get ad free content, you get all the bonus content we make, you get access to a lot of other cool things, and uh, most importantly, right now during the strike, twenty five percent of all the profits that we make from that, uh, not all the profits, twenty five percent of all the money that comes in through the membership plan is being de donated to. The strike fund so it's a great awesome. way to help support that uh great way to help support us because it does you know take a lot of effort and time and, and resources to make this podcast happen uh so please think about doing both of those things there will be that member only content in just a moment where we get more into the uh tangled web of love lives of these characters but steve uh for people who want to find more about your stuff uh you've got a podcast you've got places you create content where can yeah. you find your voice uh, so I co-host, uh, along with my best buddy, Will Freeland, a podcast called Hype is My Superpower. You can find it wherever podcasts exist. Um, and then uh, I also uh, write and self-publish independent comics, if that's something that you're interested in checking out. My my um, first title was about is called The Pros. It's about spies who work for an insurance company. Uh, it's kind of a... Uh, absurdist comedy slash political thriller uh mm -hmm. so if you're uh if you're interested in that uh find me on social media send me a dm uh because my web store isn't working right now okay sounds good sounds good well steve thank you so much for being a part of this all of our fans thank you so much for listening we have spoken <laughs> thank you so much for having me on this was a great time and uh, i really enjoyed this conversation Run!